Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Wherever you are, this is now church because you are the church. So whether you're gathering by yourself just around your cell phone or you have your whole family together around the computer, thank you for prioritizing being in the presence of God. So let's just take a moment just to pray together and then we're going to sing a few songs and then we'll be hearing from our special guest speaker this weekend. So Father, we thank you that you're already working in and through every heart. We thank you that moments of praise and adoration is where true heart change and life change happens. We love you today, God. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together.
today in this crazy season that you are the hope for today. You're the hope for the future. You're the hope for the past. There is nothing that is impossible because of who you are. We thank you for these moments and we thank you for the peace that we experience in your presence. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. We're going to hear from our very, very special guest speaker in just a moment. Keith Adamson frequently speaks nationally and internationally at conferences, universities, churches, and music festivals. He serves as the Chief of Staff at Convoy of Hope and also leads Feed One. With growing global influence, Keith serves as the Global Chairman for the World Assemblies of God Fellowship Next Generation Commission, a community of more than 360,000 churches. Keith is finishing up his PhD at the University of London. His book, Grace in the Valley, will be released in October, was released in October of 2018 through Baker Books. Keith Adamson is no stranger to our church. You're going to love his passion. You're going to love the way he communicates God's Word and you will be blessed. So let's welcome Heath Adamson as he brings forth the Word of God today. God bless you. Well, hey, City View Church, I want to thank you uh, and Pastor Troy just for your support. Uh, we have together distributed over 135 million meals all over the world during this unprecedented season. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has impacted a lot of lives. And so thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your heart for those who are marginalized and vulnerable. And together we have seen God transform um, innumerable lives. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now in our culture, uh, regardless of where you live, whether it's Burkina Faso, Spain, or in beautiful Southern California, a lot of uncertainty seems to be the common theme that we all share. And for just a few minutes today, I wanna to talk to you about that, the uncertainty, and just encourage you that there is a grace. God has a grace for us in the midst of whatever valley we find ourselves in. You know, I think of this often. I think that your story and my story, they are being written through the same divine hand. And when you look at scripture, we know that our adversary, we are told, is the author of confusion. But I like to think of it this way. God is the author of mystery. You know, one of the words that we translate miracle from the Greek New Testament is actually the word mysterion. And when you think of a miracle, perhaps you think of a marriage that was falling apart and God breathes life into it and things are restored. Or maybe you think of the young child who was diagnosed with a terminal disease and because of prayer and perhaps God working through the medical community, that young child's health is restored. When you think of a miracle, you think of restoration, you think of healing, you think of financial provision, and all of those things are equally as miraculous. But a miracle is often um, when God leads us into a moment that we would categorize as a mystery, where things just don't seem to line up. When we have an experience that does not necessarily match what we know to be true about God. So what do you do? What do I do when we encounter one of those mysteries in life? Well, it's not always easy, uh, but we have a decision to make. And that decision is that we will choose to trust God, even if our situation gives us many seemingly logical reasons not to. As a follower of Jesus, we do not memorize Jesus. We become like him. And this requires us as disciples to become good at learning and trusting and not necessarily good at knowing everything. And so when I think of mysteries and I think of situations in life that don't always line up with what we know to be true about God from scripture, I go to Psalm 23 and I'd like to share it with you. Psalm 23 says this, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. He goes on to say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. And the psalm concludes with David's words, Surely 
goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, who is David? Well, David, we are introduced to in 1 Samuel 16, David was a young shepherd boy. He was an adolescent, and one day God speaks to a prophet of God uh, to go to a particular home, a home that was owned or led by someone named Jesse. Jesse happened to be David's father. And the prophet shows up at the house, instructed by God to anoint or choose the next king over the nation of Israel. It's interesting that God instructed the prophet to go to the house that David lived in, knowing that David was not in the house, David was in the field. You know, sometimes God speaks to us and it takes time for the fulfillment of the promise to catch up. Well, the prophet shows up at Jesse's house and before you know it, the young shepherd boy David comes into the home and in a moment, David's life has changed. David is handpicked by God and anointed by the prophet to become the king over an entire nation. Now you would expect when you are chosen to become king that you move into the castle where you sit at the king's table and delight in the king's delicacies, but that's not at all what happens to David. Actually, David ends up going back to his vocation as a, as a shepherd. There's a conversation that's taking place in heaven right now that we are often unaware of. If you would have asked anyone on the earth at that time, who is the king of Israel, they would have responded, King Saul. Saul was the name of the then reigning king over the nation. But if you would have asked God, who is the king of Israel, God would have responded, David. Sometimes there are fulfillments on the earth that don't always match the language we have. God has promises, and God promised David to become king. But David goes back and continues to be a shepherd. We are reintroduced to David in 1 Samuel 17 when a Philistine giant named Goliath comes on the scene. And it is not a general, it is not an elitely trained military soldier, it is, of all people, the young shepherd boy named David whom God uses to bring down the giant. And they write songs about David. They began to sing them on the streets of the cities. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. David had only been victorious in one battle. He had only defeated one enemy, and yet they're already saying he's defeated tens of thousands. David is invited by King Saul, the king over Israel, to serve in his monarchy. David, at times, plays music um, in the chambers of the king. At times, David would have been there when the king shared meals. David served at the side of King Saul, and something horrible happened. King Saul becomes uh, very insecure, and there are very few things more dangerous on the earth than a leader who has access to power who unfortunately succumbs to insecurity. And King Saul not only feels threatened by David, he actually tries to murder David on more than one occasion. David, the one handpicked by God, does not sit on the king's throne. Instead, he leaves the king's castle and he runs for his life. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel that King Saul uh, commanded his soldiers basically to hunt David down and do whatever it was uh, necessary to eliminate the threat. Well, David is running for his life, and by the time you come to 1 Samuel chapter 22, in the forest of Hereth, David is surrounded by King Saul's elite bodyguards. His life is threatened. According to rabbinical tradition, David is actually starving to death. Um, food is insecure, and he has access to, to, to none of it. Uh, David is surrounded by his enemies. And according to the rabbis, this is when David does not write. He sings Psalm 23. And what does the shepherd boy open up his psalm with? He does not say, the Lord is my king. He does not say, the Lord is the avenger of my enemies. He does not say, the Lord is the mighty warrior. The Lord is the giant killer. No, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. David hearkens back to those days when it was just he and God under the starry sky on the hillside. Before life became complicated, before he found himself dealing with a multitude of issues, David remembered what it was like when it was just he and God. You know, I found in my own personal life when I walk through a valley, that's a good spiritual practice to just pause and refuse to complicate what is supposed to often remain simple. 
that God is our shepherd. The prophet Isaiah puts it this way, we are all like sheep. We have gone astray each to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So David opens up his psalm by saying, the Lord is my shepherd and he acknowledges therefore that he is merely a sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, David says. Now remember, David is supposedly starving to death. He is surrounded by people who want to kill him. He has a promise from God to serve as the king of a nation, and yet he's literally hiding in a cave in a forest. How, David, can you tell me, can you tell us that you want nothing? When David says, I shall not want, he is not necessarily stating the absence of desire. There are many desires that are good. The desire to have a healthy family is a good desire. The desire to get out of debt uh, is a good desire. The desire to meet the needs of those who are hurting, that is a good desire. When he says, I shall not want, it is not the absence of desire. Instead, David is saying, I refuse to be enslaved by any desires when I'm going through a difficult season. I put my faith and my trust in God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He says that God makes them lie down in green pastures. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, green pastures don't uh, necessarily exist. The only reason there's a green pasture for sheep to lie down and graze is when the shepherd goes before the sheep, the shepherd gets down on the ground and removes the jagged stones and digs them out and then irrigates and plants seed. Green pastures only exist because the good shepherd goes before the sheep to make it possible. Uh, in my research, I discovered that shepherds often lie down in, uh, in the open country with the sheep. Just imagine a shepherd, hands raw and at times even scraped and bleeding, trying to cultivate the very ground that one day the shepherd will lie down with the, sleep on, with the sheep on. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Later on in the psalm, it says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes it's easy to invert those. Sometimes it's easy, if you're like me, to walk through the green pasture and lie down in the valley. Even if our valley is steep and long and dark, it's important that we never lie down. We keep walking even if we have to crawl out of it. But God makes us lie down in green pastures. David goes on to say this, he leads me beside the still waters. A reference obviously to one of the streams for flowing through the forest of Hereth, but it also reminds me of the story in the New Testament. Uh, it's found at the end of Mark chapter four. Do you remember when Jesus invites some of his friends to get into a boat, knowing full well that a storm will break on the north side of the Sea of Galilee? A storm so violent and so tumultuous, it actually blows the little fishing boat 13 miles off course. And if you remember in the midst of that torrential downpour, the disciples are convinced they are about to die. And what do they do? They do what we all do. They, they go looking for God. They wonder where Jesus is. And where is Jesus in the midst of the horrific storm? Well, the gospel tells us he's asleep in the bottom of the boat. Now, why is Jesus sleeping in the bottom of the boat in the midst of a horrible storm? I like to suggest it's because somehow Jesus learned how to live in a space where there are no storms. How can David say he leads me beside still waters? Because even when you're in the midst of a horrific storm, the reason why Jesus can sleep is because to him, the waters are always still. He restores my soul. David goes on to say, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It does not say he leads me in a path of righteousness. Paths is plural. And I'm thankful, just as I'm sure you are, that sometimes the path paved in righteousness leads to the green pasture. But what do we do when the righteous path leads us to the valley? The valley of the shadow of death. But it's only a shadow. There's more than one path that God can lead us down, and both are paved in righteousness. And it's important to remember that even if our path takes us into the valley, we're not alone because God is with us. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David goes on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I never caught this until I spent about three years researching this psalm. In the first half of the psalm, the language that God uses to describe God is a bit abstract. God is described in terms like 
The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. But once David leaves the green pasture and he comes into the valley of the shadow of death, he becomes you. Did you see it? It says, you prepare a table for me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's a realm of intimacy that David experiences with God that is not found in the green pasture. It is found in the valley, the valley of the shadow of death. David goes on to say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David fears no evil because he receives comfort from God's rod and staff. Now, as a shepherd, sometimes the shepherds had one instrument that served as both a rod and staff, and at other times, a shepherd carried two instruments, a rod and a staff. Uh, a rod was used at times to run over the wool of the sheep to expose parasites so that the shepherd could protect the sheep. Uh, the staff was often used to protect sheep from going over a cliff. But what I learned is that shepherds at this time in history, they carved symbols and terms into their shepherd's staff. And it basically served as a living journal. So when David, for example, would have killed the lion and the bear as a shepherd, that would have been something he carved into his shepherd's staff. And the shepherd would have sat around the campfire in the evening with other friends. They take their rod and their staff and they turn it around and they would share with one another the great stories of God that they um, carved into their, into their shepherd's staff. David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. One of the best things we can do when we walk through a diff difficult, uncertain season in life is to pay attention to our self-talk. Our self-talk is formative. Our self-talk can even become prophetic. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says, for as a man or, as I will add, as a woman, thinks in their hearts, so they are. We guard our heart, out of it flow the issues of life. Um, what, we, what we think about and what we rehearse in between our ears in many ways becomes the dominant commentary uh, that we adopt with whatever our experience is. David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. One of the best things we can do is let the rod and staff of Jesus, which is scripture, um, comfort us when we go through a season that isn't always easy. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then David says this, he says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. You know, uh, Allie and I have two girls. They're both in college now. They both attend university. But I remember when our girls were a lot younger and it was their birthday. Uh, whenever we threw a party, uh, we always went to party stores and Allie always picked up the plates and the napkins and the silverware, the balloons, the streamers, and it was always pink and purple and glittery and beautiful and cute and all that. And I remember we always sat down as a family and we created uh, the list of uh, names that we were going to send invitations to. And whenever it was time to party and hang out with our girls, um, we always invited family, we invited friends, we always wanted to make sure that whoever came to the party was going to provide the, the best ultimate experience for our girls. That's what good parents do, right? I don't remember a time where Allie or myself ever looked at one another and said, hey, I have an idea. Let's invite the crazy neighbors. Let's invite the creepy relatives. Let's invite people who are a threat and a danger to society to come to our, our, our daughter's birthday party. We made sure that whoever we invited to the party was going to add and accentuate the experience. But who does God invite when God throws a party? It says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Sometimes what we think is a spiritual onslaught can actually be an invitation from God to sit down at the king's table and feast. And our enemy, by the way, is never a person. Sometimes our enemy is named depression or shame or regret, abuse, poverty, God invites our enemies, and in many ways, our enemies have to sit there and watch us feast with God. God does not prepare the table in the green pasture. God prepares the table in the valley of the shadow of death. 
but it's only a shadow. When it says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, I found three primary meanings to that reference. Um, and all three of them relate to how David identifies with God in his valley. Um, when David identifies with God as a shepherd, uh, and he says, you anoint my head with oil, uh, sheep often uh, dealt with a parasite called the nasal fly. And so a good shepherd would take um, a certain essential, a uh, mixture of essential oils and rub the oil on the nasal cavity of the sheep and it prevented the nasal fly from getting into the cavity. Uh, when the nasal fly could somehow get underneath the skin of the sheep, it can cause the sheep to go insane and the sheep would become incredibly unhealthy and often lose its life. And so a shepherd would anoint the head of the sheep with oil to keep the fly from, from uh, embedding in. David also uh, previously had been anointed by the prophet to become the king over the nation of Israel. Uh, in many ways, God anointed his head with oil, you could say. So when David says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows, in some ways, David is identifying with God as the kingmaker, that it is in God's sovereign hand to exalt and pull down. In some ways, David is identifying with God as the good shepherd. David again is saying, I'm like a sheep and you anoint my head with oil so that things don't get inside my head and cause me to behave in a way that, that doesn't line up with what I know to be true about you. But I think the most accurate interpretation of this verse comes from actually a custom that in some remote parts of the Middle East is still celebrated today. And it was a custom that was common among shepherds. So here's kind of what the custom looked like. When the sun would set over the great Sinai Peninsula and a shepherd who was always a male, and it was a male-dominated society back then, um, the shepherd always said to his family, and if he was a very wealthy shepherd, even servants, stay here. And the male shepherd walked off into the distance and found another shepherd who set up camp um, and walked up to the shepherd and somebody alerted that male shepherd and kind of here's the way it went down. You had two male shepherds standing on a hillside um, with both families looking on. And without saying a word, here was the custom. You, being a male shepherd, um, held out a container of oil for me. Sometimes it was an animal horn, uh, sometimes it was a small ceramic edifice, but it contained oil. And you handed me um, a, contain a canister of oil and I put the oil into my hand and I anointed my head with oil. And the purpose was twofold. Number one, the oil had an aromatic purpose. Remember, we are uh, herding sheep, we're wandering around the desert all day, there is no Hilton. There is no Motel 6. There's no Axe body spray for the junior high boys. There's no Bath and Body Works lotion for whoever. And so we have body odor, uh, we stink. And so the oil has an aromatic purpose, but the oil also had medicinal purpose. The oil killed head lice. And so I anoint my head with oil and then I turn around and I anoint the head of each one of my family and servants if I had them with oil as well. And without saying a word, you, being the male shepherd, you invite me and my family into your little tent and we share a meal together. This was the custom. Uh, we recline on one side, we eat with one hand. Our meal typically consisted of maybe dates, raisin cakes, um, if it was a festive time of year, um, maybe some curds, some honey, um, some flatbread, maybe some lentils, uh, a small portions of meat. And at the end of the meal, without saying a word, you, the male shepherd, you walk up to me and I hold out my cup. And what you did is you took a wineskin and you filled my cup. And if you fill my cup up halfway, it was your way of saying, you know what, Heath, the conversation's been nice, but you and your family, you, need, you must be on your, on your way now. If you fill my cup up to the top, the unwritten rule was you were inviting my family and I to spend the evening with you and yours. We would stay up at night, sit around the campfire and take our rod and staff and share the stories of old. And then in the morning before we broke camp and split off, 
Uh, we shared one more meal together. David says, God, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. God does not fill David's cup up halfway, and he doesn't even fill it up to the top. It's almost as if there is this realm of intimacy and hospitality that God provides us when we're going through a really difficult time in life. When we feel like God is far away, God draws near, and he fills our cup up overflowing. He doesn't leave us. Now we understand why David, who was surrounded by the enemy, who is starving to death, who has a promise from God to serve as the king over Israel, and yet he finds himself alone, at times afraid and uncertain, in a situation that does not line up at all with what he knows to be true about God and God's promises. Now we know why David ends his psalm with these words. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me. In Hebrew, the word follow means to pursue, to hunt down, to chase. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell not in the king's castle, not in my summer palace. He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What do we do when we find ourselves in a situation that does not line up with what we know to be true about God? Well, we choose to trust God, even if our situation gives us a reason not to. And whatever uncertainty you're currently facing and dealing with, Know this, that in the midst of it all, God has prepared a table, and there are two seats. There's one for God, and there's one for you. Take your eyes off of the enemy. Dare to relax and sit down and gaze into the eyes of God and feast, because God is near, and God loves you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Before I leave you, um, I devoted three years to studying Psalm 23. I wrote a book about it. It's, uh, it's available everywhere books are sold. It's called Grace in the Valley. I'd like to leave you with one thought from Grace in the Valley. It is easy, comfortable, and merely human to reduce life to what we see. But your story and my story are being written by the unseen one. God bless you. Hey y'all, if you enjoyed today's service, please share it with your friends and family. And if you haven't already, we would love it if you would give us a like on Facebook by searching for City View SD. If your friends and family like this service, please encourage them to give us a like as well. You can also follow our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts by searching City View San Diego or by visiting our website and going to the messages page. We also recently started a new YouTube page and would love some new subscribers. You can find us at youtube.com slash C slash City View Church SD. If you're newer to City View, we would love to connect with you. Just text the word welcome to 858-384-5811 so we can properly welcome you home. We want to invite each and every one of you to our next indoor service this coming Saturday night at 5.30 on the City View campus. That's right, we're going back inside the worship center. If you can't make it to our Saturday night service, you can always watch online starting at 9 a.m. on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, or on our website on Sunday morning. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, so make some cupcakes, send a thank you note, give a hug or a high five with some kind words, or a, find a unique way to show our pastors that we appreciate them. We will all have cards at our services that you can fill out if you'd like. Any way it goes, let's make sure our pastors know just how much they mean to us. You can also comment during our Facebook watch party, or you can email us at prayer at cityviewsd.com to let us know how we can pray for you, how this message ministered to you, or perhaps today you gave your life to Christ for the very first time or rededicated your life to Him. If you did, we have a free gift for you called One Little Yes Can Change Your Life. Just email us at prayer at cityviewsd.com or call the church at 858-560-1870 to let us know you made the greatest decision of your life today. One last thing, just a quick reminder, there are three ways that you can continue to help support God's church and the kingdom. The first is by giving online through our website at cityviewsd.com. Click on the Give Now button. From there, you can give your regular tithe and offerings, missions offerings, or anything else you want to give 
All the info is right there on the giving page. Second, you can text to give at 858-780-5141. Or lastly, you can just do it the good old fashioned way and mail it into the church office at 8404 Phyllis Place, San Diego, California, 92123. Please make sure to put attention to the finance department. Make sure to check out our website for the latest City View news. And here is Pastor Troy to close us out with a quick giving living moment. You know that the hardest thing for anyone to give up is their money, dinero, fecha. It represents our time, our energy, our talents, our personality converted into currency. We usually hold on to it tenaciously, yet we cannot take it with us after we die. The scriptures teaches us that we are stewards for a little while, we all, while all of us earn. If we misuse it, as did the man who buried his talents, it brings upon severous judgment of God. I want you to remember, church, that the tithe is the Lord's. If people use it for themselves, they're robbing God. We are all to take the tithe as a standard, but to go beyond the tithe is an indication of our gratefulness for God's gift to us through our offerings like in missions. In the midst of sorrow and trouble, this life has many blessings and enjoyments which have come from the hand of God. Even our capacity to love others is a gift from God. We should show our gratitude by giving back to God a part of that which He has given to us. 1 John 3, 17 says, But if someone who is supposed to be a Christian has money enough to live well and sees a brother in need and won't help him, how can God lo God's love be within him? I hope that you live and give with a generous heart that does not grudgingly give back to him all that is rightfully yours, O God. So let me pray for you as we close out our online service today and as we give passionately with our tithe and our missions offerings today or sometime this week coming up. God bless you. And again, thank you for giving to God and for giving for his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. What a wonderful word and a time in your presence, Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, as we wrap up our online service, we pray that you would use these tithe and these offerings to advance your kingdom, both here in San Diego, in California, throughout the nation, and throughout the world, God. In this wonderful name, we pray. Bless your people today. Protect them, guide them, and see them through. And all that they say and all that they do as they give, Lord God, and declare the Lordship of Jesus Christ through the receiving of the tithe and offerings to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. See you next week.